Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork. Where I live in the Intermountain West of the United States, we have a holiday that most other people in the country have never heard of. The celebration is called either the 24th of July or the Days of 47, and we usually have things like rodeos, fireworks, picnics, and a giant parade. This is basically a Founders' Day celebration to commemorate the people who first settled this area, and the first group arrived in the Salt Lake Valley on July 24, 1847. In honor of this holiday, I wanted to share some insight that most people have never heard about the handcart pioneer experience. This episode is intended particularly for members of my faith, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but anyone is welcome to listen. The first pioneers who came to the Salt Lake Valley in 1847 were mostly people who had lived in the eastern United States. Many had lived in a city called Nauvoo, but had been driven from their homes and fled as refugees to this desolate desert that nobody else wanted. The Salt Lake Territory was not a part of the United States at that time, so they were fleeing the country for their safety and their freedom. The early pioneers, including the first arrivals in 1847, came with covered wagons drawn by teams of oxen. But some of the most famous and heart-wrenching stories of the pioneers are the Willie and Martin handcart companies that came across the plains in 1856, which is about nine years after the first settlers arrived. The handcart pioneers were all from Europe. They had never been to Palmyra or Kirtland or Nauvoo, and they had never met the Prophet Joseph Smith because he had been dead for over a decade. So how did these people learn about the church, and why would they want to come to the Salt Lake Valley? Well, after the first pioneers arrived in the Salt Lake Valley, President Brigham Young called people on missions to Europe, and they were very successful. By 1852, there were more than twice as many members of the church in Europe as there were gathered in the Salt Lake Valley. Those new converts wanted desperately to join with the other saints in the Salt Lake Valley, but the journey was really expensive and they couldn't afford it. It was a long, long way away. The trek from Liverpool, England to Salt Lake was about 4,600 miles long which, if you think about it, is approximately one-fifth of the circumference of the entire Earth. The journey took over six months to complete. First, immigrants had to take a ship from Liverpool to New York. The next step was to get on a train. Now, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, and after that time, anyone who wanted to get to the Salt Lake Valley could just ride the train there. But in 1856, which is when the Willie and Martin handcart companies came west, the train could only take them as far as Iowa City. That was the end of the line. The train didn't go any farther west. So from there, the only choices were to use wagons or to walk the last 1,200 miles. So those people in Europe who joined the church began saving their money and waiting. They wanted to come gather with the saints, but they just couldn't afford the trip. President Brigham Young wanted to help them, so he introduced a program called the Perpetual Immigration Fund, which was a plan where members of the church lent money to the European saints so they could come across. And then, instead of paying the money back, they paid it forward as a loan to the next European saints so that they could come across. That program helped, but it wasn't enough because so many people wanted to come who couldn't afford the trip. So President Brigham Young came up with another idea to help. Instead of using wagons for that last part of the journey from Iowa City to Salt Lake, they could use hand carts. Hand carts were little carts with big wheels that had handles in the front and back that people could push and pull and it could carry some stuff. Not as much as a big wagon, but it was big enough to carry a tent, some bedding, cooking supplies, and some food. 
Hand carts were a lot cheaper than paying for a wagon and a team of oxen. And, interestingly, they traveled just as fast. Groups who traveled with oxen and wagon took about a hundred days, which is about three and a half months to travel from Iowa City to Salt Lake. And the hand cart companies took the same amount of time to travel the same distance. The hand cart idea had some other advantages besides just being less expensive. The immigrants who became the handcart pioneers had mostly grown up living and working in the cities. They weren't great outdoorsmen. They didn't know how to camp or set up tents or cook over a fire or anything like that. And they didn't know how to handle a yoke of oxen any more than I do, which is not at all. But they did know how to walk. The handcart experiment was planned and well-organized. Brigham Young called service missionaries to Iowa City who welcomed each group of immigrants and helped them get started. They had people who taught them how to make their tents and people who taught them how to build their hand carts and told them what supplies to bring. And each company was organized with a captain who knew the trail. In addition, each hand cart company traveled with a few wagons to carry additional food and supplies because the little hand cart doesn't carry very much. They also had a few places planned along the trail that were designated as supply posts so they could replenish their food supplies along the way. The new plan worked beautifully, most of the time. More than 3,000 people traveled by handcart to the Salt Lake Valley. There were 10 handcart companies in all. Eight of them did great and didn't have any notable problems, and you probably never even heard of them. But two of those handcart companies, one led by Captain Willie and another led by Captain Martin, that had incredible bad luck and a few poor decisions, and a lot of people suffered, and a lot of people died. These are the handcart pioneers that we remember the most because they paid the greatest price. One of the biggest problems was that they left late in the season, which really wasn't their fault. They were delayed on the first segment of their journey. But what does late in the season mean anyway? Well, during this period in history, a lot of people were moving out west. Most pioneers were heading to California or Oregon, but those who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were heading to the Salt Lake Valley. The trail was pretty well established, and everybody knew how long it took to travel from the edge of civilization in Independence, Missouri, to their destination out west. And those who led the pioneer companies to the Salt Lake Valley knew that it takes about 100 days, or three and a half months, to make the journey. Now, the terrain across the country is pretty flat. That is, until you get to Wyoming. And then it is mountain, 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 all the way till you get into the Salt Lake Valley. So, you have to be able to get through the mountains and down into the valley before the end of September. Otherwise, you might get caught in snowstorms and you could die. So, in order to be through the mountains by the end of September, that meant you had to leave Iowa City by no later than the middle of June. In 1856, the first handcart company arrived at the train station in Iowa City in the middle of May. There were people there to help them with their wagons and their tents, and they were ready to go by June 9th. A second handcart company arrived shortly after the first, and they were ready to leave Iowa City two days later. Then, a third handcart company arrived at Iowa City in early June, and it took them about three weeks to get everything ready to go. It was then June 23rd. And remember, you must leave no later than the middle of June in order to make it to the valley before the end of September. So this group was already about a week later than the latest that they should be starting, and they were cutting it really close. So obviously, this would be the last handcart company for the season. So, naturally, all the service missionaries who had been helping the immigrants packed up, and they went west with the handcart company. They were going home. <laughs> 
planning to come back the following year to help the next immigrants who came through. Well, three days after this third handcart company and all the service missionaries who were helping them left, then the Willie Handcart Company arrived in Iowa City. There was no one there to meet them and help them with their tents and wagons because the service missionaries had already left. No one knew that more handcart companies were coming. Remember, this was a long time before cell phones, and there was no way to let them know. Then, almost two weeks later, another handcart company, led by Captain Martin, arrived in Iowa City. So they were even later getting started. Now, the plan for the people who arrive at Iowa City is to sew their tents, build their handcarts, and gather supplies for the journey. But for these last two companies, there were no service missionaries there to help them. So everything took even longer than it was supposed to. And then, to compound the problem, there had been a building boom in that area, and construction projects had used up all the available wood. There wasn't any seasoned wood available for purchase anywhere. This meant that the Willie and Martin handcart companies had to find whatever wood they could. That meant that they were using unseasoned wood, which is sometimes called green wood, which had not been properly dried. Now, if wood hasn't been properly dried, then it warps and shrinks as it dries, which creates warped carts and warped wheels, which makes them harder to push, and they needed frequent repairs, all of which slowed them down even further. Now, the immigrants were not skilled carpenters either. For most of them, building a handcart was the first building project they had ever done. And because they had trouble finding wood and trouble building their carts, it took precious time that delayed their departure even longer. While the men were building carts, the women were making tents. And they encouraged the children to take off their shoes and run around barefoot. They did this to toughen up their feet. Most of the children walked the trail barefoot because it was actually more comfortable than wearing the shoes that they had. However, when the snow falls, you definitely want to put your shoes back on. Each member of the handcart company was allowed to bring only 17 pounds of personal luggage and gear. The reason for this limit was the difficulty of pulling a handcart day after day, and it meant that many of their precious possessions had to be left behind. After they had traveled about 250 miles, they arrived at a place called Florence, Nebraska. This is the same place which was called Winter Quarters by Brigham Young and the earlier pioneers. Here, years before, Brigham Young and the first pioneers stayed after being driven out of Nauvoo. They waited here through the winter until springtime when they could travel across the plains. Now, when the Willie Handcart Company arrived at this spot, they had a very difficult decision to make. Should they wait here until spring, too? Maybe it could be a winter quarters for them. Or should they travel on to the Salt Lake Valley? Levi Savage, who was a missionary returning home from Europe, had already crossed the plains more than once and he understood the dangers of crossing late in the season. He strongly counseled them not to go, but he promised to stay with the group no matter what their decision was. Many people were unhappy about the things that he said because he made it sound pretty scary. Unfortunately, all the things that he said about the dangers were absolutely true. Meanwhile, Captain Willie, who was also a missionary on his way home from Europe, and the one who was assigned to take care of this huge group of people, knew that there wasn't enough food or shelter here to sustain such a large group over the winter. He felt like they were likely to freeze and starve if they stayed there, and he thought that their best option was to move on to the Salt Lake Valley, where they could get help. They felt like they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. So anyone who judges them for deciding to move forward may not have a clear understanding of the challenges that they were facing. At that meeting, 
they did decide to move forward. But things did not go well. When they arrived at where there was supposed to be a resupply station at Fort Laramie, Wyoming, they found that there was nobody there, and there were no supplies waiting for them. Remember that the handcart companies could not carry all of the supplies necessary to complete the whole journey. The leaders of the church knew this and planned to have supply wagons meet the expected companies at a couple places along the trail. And this worked really well for the first three handcart companies that went through that year. But remember that everyone thought that that third handcart company was the last one for the season. So when the third handcart company was restocked with supplies, they thought, okay, that's everybody. So they closed up shop and went back to Salt Lake. That meant that when the Willie and Martin handcart companies arrived, there were no supplies there waiting for them. Basically, they arrived after the store closed, and the store wouldn't reopen until next year. You may have heard stories about rations of a quarter cup of flour per person per day. Now, I know when I first heard that, I thought, what idiot would plan for a quarter cup of flour per day for a physically exhausting journey? And the answer is that no one planned that. But since there were no supplies at the supply station, they had to look at what food they had left and reduce their rations to try to make the food last as long as possible. They knew that there was one more resupply station along the trail, and they hoped that their food would last until then, and they really, really hoped that there would be supplies there for them. They knew perfectly well that they didn't have enough food to last the entire journey, and if they didn't get some more food somehow, they would starve to death. It was not looking good. But God had not abandoned them, and there were still miracles. One miracle is that they were passed on the trail by Franklin D. Richards, who was returning home from serving as the mission president in Europe. He is the one who assigned these returning missionaries to lead the handcart companies to the Salt Lake Valley, and he thought they would have arrived in the valley by now. He didn't know that they had encountered delays. When he found out where they were and realized how far they still had to go, he knew they would be in big trouble when the snow began to fall. Since he was traveling in a little group and they had horses, they could travel quickly. So they went as fast as they could to Salt Lake and told Brigham Young there were still handcart companies on the plains. This was the first step of the rescue mission. If President Richards hadn't delivered that message, no rescue party would have arrived because the people in the Salt Lake Valley didn't know the handcart companies were out there. And every single person in both the Willie and Martin handcart companies would have died. However, because President Richards relayed that message to Brigham Young, now he knew that there were people out there and he immediately began organizing a rescue effort. But it took time for President Richards to get to the valley and deliver the message, and it took time to organize a rescue party, and it took time for the rescue party to travel back up the trail toward the handcart companies, which meant that in the meantime, the handcart pioneers were starving, and people started dying. George D. Grant led the first 16 relief wagons from Salt Lake City on October 7, 1856. He found the Willie Handcart Company two weeks later on October 21st. He left some of the men and half the wagons to help Willie's company, and then pressed eastward with the remaining wagons and rescuers to help the more than 1,000 other saints who were still on the trail. About half of these were traveling with handcarts under Captain Martin. The rest were in wagons that were led by Ben Hodgetts and John Hunt. So. The Willie Handcart Company now had eight wagons and a few rescuers to help them, but they still had to keep moving, and their worst ordeal was yet to come. <laughs> 
They had a five-mile climb over Rocky Ridge in a howling snowstorm with 18 to 24 inches of snow already on the ground. The climb and the conditions were so intense that 13 people died from exertion. They dug a mass grave to bury the dead, and two of those who were digging the grave died from the exertion of digging. So there were actually 15 people buried at that site. Among the dead was a little nine-year-old girl named Bodil Mortensen. Bodil was an immigrant from Denmark. Missionaries had come to Denmark and taught her family the gospel, and they taught them about the gathering of Israel. They couldn't all afford to go together, so they began sending family members over one at a time. Bodil's oldest sister, Anne, went first, and she arrived in the valley in 1855. The following year, some of their friends, Jens and Elsie Nielsen, were making the trip, so the family sent Bodil, who was just nine years old, to go along with them in the Willie Handcart Company. And then the plan was for the rest of the family to come the following year in 1857. When Bodil's parents arrived in the Salt Lake Valley, they looked for their daughters to reunite their family. It was then that they learned of the hardships that their little daughter had endured. They learned that little Bodil had suffered hunger and cold. They heard the story about Rocky Ridge Pass, where they climbed through deep snow during a raging blizzard and freezing temperatures. Bodil climbed with several other younger children, shivering and hungry, up the steep, snow-covered slope. Bodil was exhausted and weak, and when she finally arrived at camp in the wee hours of the morning, she went to gather firewood, but all she could find were a few twigs of sagebrush. The next morning, she was found leaning up against the wheel of a handcart, frozen to death, with the twigs still clutched in her hands. The news devastated her mother, who never recovered from losing her beautiful child, and eventually suffered a nervous breakdown and died just five years after arriving in the valley. Those who had survived Rocky Ridge carried on to Fort Bridger. By this time, more rescuers and more supply wagons had arrived under the direction of Reddick Allred. There were now enough wagons to carry the sick and those with frozen feet, so the Willie Handcart Company abandoned their handcarts at Fort Bridger and hurried on. They arrived in the Salt Lake Valley a week later, on November 9, 1856, having lost 67 members of their party. Meanwhile, other rescuers pressed on trying to find the Martin Handcart Company, which were farther away. They had just lost 56 people within nine days since a horrible river crossing with mushy snow and ice, and they had no fuel for a fire to dry off afterwards. Then they were caught in a snowstorm, and it was impossible to travel onward. It looked completely hopeless. And then, out of the blue, three men arrived in camp on horseback. These three men were members of the rescue party. They had been sent on ahead of the main rescue party to find out where the Martin Company was and to assess their condition. What they saw broke their hearts. But since they were just a scouting party, they didn't have any provisions with them. So at that point, all they could give the members of the Martin Company was hope that people were trying to help them. But the supply wagons could not get through the snow to where they were, and they had to keep going. The supply wagons were 55 miles away at a place called Devil's Gate. Then, two of the rescuers stayed with the handcart company, and the third raced back to tell the other rescuers that the Martin handcart company was in bad shape, so they needed to hurry. Rescuers immediately moved out. Although the supply wagons couldn't move on, more men on horseback could 
So they brought some food and met the handcart company near Greasewood Creek. When the Martin Handcart Company reached Greasewood Creek, the rescuers had a meal prepared and fires going so the weary travels could eat and warm themselves. That was a welcome sight. But unfortunately, their troubles were far from over. They continued on to Devil's Gate, where the supply wagons were. Near this place, there was an abandoned trading post called Fort Seminole. There were a few buildings here, but not enough to house all of the pioneers. There were about 1,000 people who needed shelter, food, warm clothing, and blankets. It was 11 degrees below freezing, with 12 to 16 inches of snow and a bitter wind. One of the collapsed buildings of the fort was dismantled to provide firewood, but even so, 13 more people died that night. They desperately needed shelter from the storm. So they decided to move on to a nearby cove that would at least offer some protection from the winds, and there was firewood available there. Unfortunately, in order to reach that cove, which is now called Martin's Cove, they had to cross another river. As they came to the Sweetwater River, many, remembering that terrible experience of their last crossing of the North Platte River, they fell to the ground and sobbed, saying, We can't do that. A few men of the rescue party stepped into the river and spent a good part of the day carrying most of the Martin Handcart Company people across to the other side. When President Brigham Young later heard of this heroic act, he wept like a child, and later declared publicly, that act alone will ensure C. Allen Huntington, George W. Grant, and David P. Kimball an everlasting salvation in the celestial kingdom of God, worlds without end. Now, evidence indicates that there were more than three rescuers who braved the icy water that day. But those are the three names of the young men that we know. Then they held a council to decide what to do next. Do we try to survive the winter here? Or do we try to get to the valley? By this time, two-thirds of the handcart members could walk no further. There were a couple wagon trains also traveling to the Salt Lake Valley called the Hunt and Hodgett trains. They were hauling freight and additional immigrants to the Salt Lake Valley. The decision was that the only way to save the Martin Handcart Company was to ask everybody in the Hunt and Hodgett trains to give up their wagons and leave their supplies and to use those wagons along with the rescue wagons to carry the survivors to safety. That was a major sacrifice for everybody in the Hunt and Hodgett trains. These wagons were carrying all of the supplies that they hoped to use to build a new life in the Salt Lake Valley. That meant that suddenly they were just as destitute as everybody in the handcart companies. And the supplies weren't just for those people in the Hunt and Hodgett trains. There were also supplies that other settlers who were living in the valley had ordered in from the east. These people weren't here to give permission to abandon their stuff. But it was either leave the stuff or everybody dies. So they emptied the wagons. The freight and supplies were left at the fort with a few of the rescuers volunteering to stay behind to guard their possessions. This winter guard consisted of about 20 of the rescuers who were mostly young men and they were led by a man named Daniel Jones. The guard had just 20 days of rations with five months of winter still ahead of them. When their rations ran out, the men ate cowhide, they ate their leather moccasins. They even ate an old buffalo robe that had been used as a doormat. They prayed that the Lord would bless their stomachs so that they could gain some nourishment from this poor food. With faith and some help from local Indians, fur trappers, and mail carriers, all 20 men survived the winter. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, the Martin Handcart Company kept traveling. But by now, the supplies that the rescuers had brought ran out. And now, both the handcart pioneers and the rescuers were starving and freezing to death. They needed more rescuers. The rescue effort ultimately amounted to 250 wagons full of food, clothing, shoes, and blankets. On October 26, President Young called for yet more volunteers to go out and help the beleaguered handcart travelers. Two nights before this particular meeting, a man named Ephraim Hanks heard a voice calling him by name and saying, The handcart people are in trouble, and you are wanted. Will you go and help them? Ephraim wrote, I turned instinctively in the direction from whence the voice came and beheld a stranger, an ordinary-sized man in the room. Without any hesitation, I answered, Yes, I will go if I am called. This message was repeated two more times. Ephraim was in a place called Utah Lake, which is about 30 miles south of Salt Lake City. But after he received this message, he loaded up a wagon and hastened to Salt Lake City, where he arrived in time to hear Brigham Young's call for volunteers to go out and help bring in the last of the handcart companies. Several men volunteered, and they said they could get ready to leave in a few days. Ephraim spoke at once, saying, I am ready now. So he headed out with a light wagon all alone. At South Pass in Wyoming, Ephraim encountered a terrible snowstorm. He had never seen worse. Realizing the possible fate of the saints in the handcart company, he left his wagon and set out alone on horseback, leading a pack horse. Now you can't carry a lot of food on a pack horse. So he asked the Lord to send him a buffalo. After praying, he looked around and spied a buffalo bull within 50 yards of his camp. He shot it and prepared the meat before going to sleep for the night. The following morning, he shot another buffalo. He knew that it was rare to see any buffalo at this late part of the season, and he knew that the buffalo were an answer to his prayers. That evening, November 11th, he saw the Martin Handcart Company in the distance and their situation broke his heart. Their food supply was nearly exhausted, and they were so grateful to have a fresh supply of meat. He treated frostbite on several members of the company, and he had to amputate the toes of many of the people that had been badly frostbitten. He gave several priesthood blessings to the suffering saints, and then he stayed with them all the way until they reached the Salt Lake Valley. On November 30th. The Willie Handcart Company had started with about 500 people and about 67 died. They lost about 13 percent or one out of every eight people. The Martin Handcart Company started with about 576 people and about 145 died before reaching the Salt Lake Valley. They lost about 25%, or one out of every four people. If it had not been for the valiant rescue efforts, none of the members of the Willie or Martin handcart companies would have survived. And those rescue efforts did not end when the handcart companies entered the Salt Lake Valley. President Brigham Young said, We will continue our labors of love until they are able to take care of themselves. When the handcart pioneers arrived in the valley, they were greeted with people lining the streets who took them into their own homes and nursed them back to health. All in all, thousands of people helped in the rescue efforts, and about 1,250 lives were saved. The rescue of the Willie and Martin handcart companies is a story of courage, of faith, of sacrifice, and of heroes 
When I hear the stories of the suffering that the Willie and Martin handcart pioneers endured, my heart just breaks. I wonder, as many other people have wondered, why God allows bad things to happen to good people. They weren't being punished for being disobedient or stupid. They just had a series of unfortunate events that put them in a really bad situation. But why didn't God protect them? Why did he allow all this suffering to take place? Why didn't he stop the storms? Why didn't he do something equivalent to the parting of the Red Sea to help them? I don't have all the answers. And I'm certainly not the first person to ask these kinds of questions. In sections 121 and 122 of the Doctrine and Covenants, is recorded an experience when the Prophet Joseph Smith was a prisoner in a jail ironically called Liberty during a time when the saints were being cruelly persecuted and he was powerless to help. He asked God a similar question. O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? And the response he received from the Lord was, My son, Peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. If thou art called to pass through tribulation, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Therefore hold on thy way, thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you for ever and ever. Life is not always easy, or kind, or fair. For example, we recently learned that my beautiful five-month-old grandson has cancer, and he began his first chemo treatment this week. He's just a baby. Babies should never have to suffer, and the whole situation is heartbreaking. This experience once again brings about all the questions about why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why didn't God protect my baby grandson? Why does he allow this suffering to take place? Then those words in Doctrine and Covenants sections 121 and 122 speak to me personally. O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? And the response from God is, My daughter, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. If thou art called to pass through tribulation, know thou, my daughter, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Therefore hold on thy way. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. We know that this mortal experience is not all there is. 
life continues after the grave. And at some point after this life, we'll be able to look at the whole picture and say, it's okay. The reward is fair and just and merciful. If we didn't understand that promise, then the suffering that takes place on earth would be simply unbearable. God didn't prevent the Willie and Martin handcart companies from experiencing trials. But there were miracles that indicate that he was with them in their trials. God is not preventing me and my family from experiencing trials. But there are small miracles that indicate that he is with us in our trials. There are some good things that came as a result of the handcart experiences. The power and the drama of their experiences ensure that their stories live on. We remember their sacrifices, and it touches our hearts. Their sacrifices also establish a price or a value to their beliefs. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ was worth more to them than their comfort, their convenience, their homes, their belongings, and their very lives. We even encourage our youth to participate in Pioneer Trek experiences where they visit the historic sites or recreate those experiences by dressing as pioneers and pushing handcarts in whatever part of the world they happen to be living in. And we retell these stories because the faith, courage, and heroism shown by the pioneers and the rescuers inspire us to do better and to be better. In closing, I'd like to share a quote from President Thomas S. Monson. Let us not only remember the past and its required sacrifice, let us also remember that we are responsible to build a legacy for the generations which follow us. See you next time on Linda's Corner.